Okay, good morning, everyone. All right, good morning to our students online as well. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our teaching. Father, we thank you so much for yet another beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the ability to learn and to grow in the things of God. And I pray, God, that even as we study and learn, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak and minister to each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So last class, we completed up to chapter 83. And now we pick up from chapter 84. Sorry, 82 is what we, where we completed. So we start from 83, right? Is that right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so chapter 83, called to his purpose. Now, when the Lord Jesus called us, he didn't say all you have to do is, you know, sit around and do nothing. Right? Just keep praying the whole day, keep worshipping the whole day. No. God has called us for a purpose. Each one of us have an earthly purpose. Yes or no? Right? On earth, God has placed us because we have a purpose. And even as we continue to live our life, the Lord Jesus and through his Holy Spirit enables us to fulfill the purpose that God has for our life. Right? There's two important things that we, we must understand when we say the word purpose. One is a heavenly purpose. One is an earthly purpose. What is a heavenly purpose? A heavenly purpose is basically that we become more like Jesus. We are, we, we, our attitude, our lives are glorify Jesus. Heavenly purpose. And then there's the earthly purpose. Somebody can be called as a businessman, a worship leader, a pastor, or uh, uh, just working professional. That's your earthly purpose. Right? Now let's look at called for his purpose, Romans chapter 8, 28 and 30, 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I, how many of you like this? I really enjoy this verse. right? And we know all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, and are called according to his purpose. So in life, you know, this verse is really a powerful verse that we can declare. Right? Why? Because not everything we want in life will happen the way we want it. Right? There will be ups and downs. Everything will not be smooth in life. Then if everything is smooth in life, what? That's not how life is, right? There will be ups and downs. But in that ups and downs, in those difficult times, in those seasons of pain and suffering, we can go to this verse. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. I may not understand why this is good. God, I'm going through this trouble, this period of challenge and difficulty. I don't understand why I have to go through it. I've been a good person. I've been praying. I've been reading the word. I've been doing everything right. But why should I go through this challenge? Why should I go through all this trouble? What wrong did I do? How many of you have felt that? Right? You never, others have never felt that? Very good. Everything's happening good in your life. That's good. But I felt it many times, right? Why? Why is it that we should go through this? So worse. God says, he works all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God has called us. He has a purpose for us. And through every season, he's faithful. Right? Look at verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Look at that. Whom he predestined, he also called them. Who he has called, 
he has justified what is justified okay you should know this by now just just as if we have not ah one more time what is justified okay i trust you just as if we are not sin those who have called he has called he has justified those who are, he has justified, he has glorified. Right? First Corinthians chapter two, one, verse twenty-six through twenty-nine. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But we looked at this last class as well. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God has chosen the foolish to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak to put to shame the mighty or the, or the, um, uh, the, the mighty people in this world. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. So basically, Paul is saying, when God chooses, chooses us, he appoints us, he calls us for a purpose. And when you are invited and appointed by God, it's not that you are perfect. It's not that I am perfect. It's not that I am the strongest. It's not that you know we have the wisdom. No. He has chosen the weak. He has chosen those who are uh, you know, unwise. To show what the wisdom of God is to the people, right? So, what does it teach us? If God is calling us for something, we don't, you know, uh, you know, studying, learning God's word, improving ourselves, very important. Yes or no? Right? We have to learn. We have to study. We have to learn. Spend time in God's word. You know, uh, especially if, you're, if you want to become a preacher. You know, initially I was in for a shock. Because I thought, okay, preaching, no problem. Prepared one sermon, went there, tried to preach. So I was fully prepared. I prayed. I said, God, you will do some great wonders here. After this, after preparing, and I went there to preach, what was a 30 minute sermon or 40 minute sermon? I finished in 10 minutes. 10 minutes is over. So I said, what to do now? People are sitting. And it was such an embarrassing thing. Right? Uh, 10 minutes. I prepared the sermon for 30 minutes, but when I went there, 10 minutes. Then I understood, hey, I have to practice it. I have to practice preaching it. What I'm going to say, when I'm going to say, when I'm going to use the examples, what to explain, what not to explain, how to explain, so many things involved. Right? So, Prayer is important. That is the main foundation. But if you want to become a preacher or a, or a speaker, a teacher, or even a worship leader, you have to practice. The practical has to be there. I cannot say I'll become a, I want to become a pastor and do nothing the whole week. It's not going to work. You have to practice. So God calls the weak. We may not be qualified. We may not be people who are, you know, have many degrees, right? If you have many degrees, that's good. But if you don't have, it's okay. Because God does not qualify those only who are high in knowledge. He qualifies the weak. He chooses the weak and he qualifies them to shame the wise. You get what I'm saying, right? If God is calling you for something, don't look at what you are right now. Look at what you can be. Get it? Are you with me? Right? Don't look at what you are right now. Look at what God can make you. But if God has called you, there's a bigger responsibility. I can't say, okay, now I'm like this, but look at five years down the line, I'll be a prophet in the ministry. That's good. But for that, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? 
if you have to become a preacher, a great evangelist, or a great pastor, what must you do? Practice, okay. What else? First, first practice is not first. What is the first thing you should do? Ah, you must spend time in God's presence. You must spend time being in His presence. Only then you can do this. Right? So God invites us to enter into His purposes. We are called with a sense of purpose. Right? Chapter 84, justified in a sight. We've already talked about this. Let's go to chapter 85. We are glorified together with Jesus. Now, what is the word glorified together with Jesus? What does the word glorified mean? The word glorified means to fill with His presence. Lord, let your glory fall. We sing that song, no? Or the glory of the Lord, let it rise upon us. The word glory means His presence, His power, His, His, His divine presence, His authority, His rule, His reign. That's what glory is. Right? So Romans 8.28, he says here, again, the same verse. But let's go to verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image, in, uh, to the image of his son. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he justified, these he also called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he has glorified. That means he has poured out his presence upon us. He has changed us. What does glorified mean? It is a sense of worth. Right? A sense of being worthy. Now let me ask you this question. Are we worthy? Are we worthy? No, Pastor. Very good. How many of you feel you are worthy? Are we worthy? Yes or no? No? We are not worthy. But how come we come to God's presence in so much of boldness? Because? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. But when Jesus looks at us, He looks at us as worthy. But are we worthy? Without Jesus, are we worthy? No. And not only did Jesus give us a sense of worthiness, He says, no longer you are orphans, you are my children. That's why the parable of the lost son is so powerful. It's, a, it's an example of what Jesus did for us. We, what, we, everyone know the parable of the lost son? right? Two brothers, one says, give me my money goes away, spends it all in sinful living. Next thing he knows, he's with the pigs. Then he comes back home. What is the father doing? Standing with a belt? Come. Come. I have a place ready for you now. What does Jesus do? What does the father do? He, he counts him worthy. He says, OK, come here. You are staying with the pigs. You're smelling. Go have bath three times. Go give an offering and then come back. Does he say? What does he say? He goes and hugs him. He says, hey, you're my son. Change your clothes. Put a robe. The word in the Old Testament, robe means kingship, honor. Put a ring. Ring means authority. Remember, Daniel, the signet ring. It's authority. Sandals. It means inheritance. He made him worthy. Was he worthy? I was just thinking if, if you know, if, if it happens to an earthly father, what will the earthly father do? He has two choices. A very good father will say, okay, come. But for you, nothing left. You've taken your share. Don't ask me anything more. You can stay in the house. Now, a father who's very upset will say, don't even come near the door. You go somewhere else. There may be your own blood, but still, you know, there's all this. 
what does what does this father do? Owns him worthy. Does the son ever feel worthy? Maybe in the story, the son is feeling, oh no, no, I don't all this. I just thought I'll come and sit quietly, ask for forgiveness, and sit at home. Father said, No. You're my son, we have to celebrate. No, no, don't tell everyone that I've come back. No, it's oh, you've come back home. You were once dead, now you're alive. So I have to celebrate. I want people to know that you are dead and now you're alive. You see that sense of worthiness? Right? That's what Jesus did for us. He made us worthy when we were not worthy at all. Right? Then we are the beloved of the Father, meaning we are deeply loved. We are His family. We have a rich inheritance. We share with Christ and we represent His kingdom. When there will come a time in, when the rapture happens, right? When the Lord Jesus will come, that time we will be physically also glorified. Right? Our bodies will change. We'll get a glorified body, the same body which Jesus had. That means what? When Jesus came after he resurrected from the dead, did they recognize this Jesus? Yes or no? When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he came to meet the disciples. Did the disciples say, oh, this is a watchman? What did they say? It's Jesus. They could recognize Jesus. They saw the glorified body. What, is, what did he do? He sat and ate breakfast. Fish. He ate in front of them. Then he said, come and touch. Thomas, you touch, touch my side and see. I'm not a ghost. So you and I will get this glorified body. But right now, on earth, as we are living, God fills us with his glory. Right? And all of these aspects are there with us. OK, chapter 86. We are the beloved of the Father, Ephesians 1, 4. Now, this is, again, very familiar, very powerful verse. Just as he chose us in him, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Just as he chose us in him. Now there is two, he and him, right? Just as who chose us? God the Father chose us, the first he is God, in him, that is Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world. Can you believe that? When the Lord Jesus, when God, before he created this world, he chose us to be in his kingdom. And he predestined. He said, okay, this is what this person, this is the plan that I have. Right? This is the plan I have for this person. Right Now, for example, you want to build a house. You call the architect. The architect comes and he look at the place and he'll say, okay, how many bedroom house do you want? Oh, I want a duplex with four bedrooms and, and two hall rooms and there should be three car parking. Okay. So the architect knows what to do. So what does he do? He designs the house and he takes time. He designs, okay, where can I put the bedroom? Where can I put the parking? So the parking should always be in front, most of the house. Now imagine the parking is somewhere on the side. You have to go around the house two times. No. So he makes a blueprint. Okay, This is bedroom one, bedroom two, open kitchen. This is bedroom three, bedroom four. This is open area. He makes the blueprint. He gives it to the owner. Now it is the owner's choice whether he wants to follow it or not. That's the best plan. What the architect is given. The owner can say, no, I don't want this plan. I want a different plan. I want four bedrooms down on top. I only want to play cricket. So I want empty space on top. That's your wish. But to make the best use of this place, this is the plan, best plan. This is the blueprint. But the owner has the choice. Right? He can do whatever he wants to do. If he follows it, it may be good. Right? The house will be good. If he doesn't follow it, it's his wish. He's doing what he wants to do. Now, you are the owner of your body right now. 
meaning you are the owner of the decisions you make is god coming and shaking you every morning and say do this god won't do that you have the choice for your own decisions right so there's a blueprint yeah just as god chose us in him before the foundation of the world so god had decided okay joseph joseph is in front of me for the online students joseph this is what i have a plan for you before the foundation of the world okay before god said everything let there be earth all of that this is the purpose i have for joseph when he's 15 years old he'll come to know the lord i'm just sharing right and when he's 20 he will join bible college when he is 25 he will start his ministry and then when he's 28 this is what will happen 30 this is what this is the blueprint i have and the choice is joseph's he says i don't want ministry i want to work god will say okay go but still god is faithful god won't say okay go do what you want i will not protect you no you right but since god has chosen he has a plan before the foundation of the world when we follow god when we begin to pray and god ministers to us he leads us what are we doing we're following the blueprint ah so this is how i should do this is what i should do you know when the construction of the house is happening will they build the restroom first what will they do first first foundation Right? Or will they do the car parking first? No, it's all the basics. First, they'll do the foundation, or even before that, they'll do the bore well. They'll finish all the work, digging work. Then, when the wall is coming up, okay, some shape is coming for the house. And finally, you reach the walls are reached ten uh, feet high. Oh, very nice. Now you know. Okay, this is room one, room two, room three, but it's not completed. But you know it. Now Joseph knows God has called him to be a pastor. Where there's no church, there's no pastor. Why? Because the digging is happening. The blueprint is there, but it has to get fulfilled. It'll take time, right? God is working. We have to work along with God. Okay, everyone with me? Okay. So we are the beloved of His Father, of the Father. He has chosen us. we receive his love and rest in his love look at this next verse next word here sentence god is too good to do you wrong he is too wise to make a mistake and he is too strong to let you down isn't that powerful god is too good to do you wrong you now many times we do wrong and we blame god god you said no god is saying i didn't say anything you did it all through the old testament if we see it is not god god didn't say anything god told adam don't eat the fruit very simple he ate what did he say the woman you gave me god told moses i will use you no god told abraham i will make you the father of many nations i'll give you a son but in between what happened ishmael did i tell you Three. God told Moses, Moses, I'll make you the leader. I'll bring you out of uh, Egypt. You will lead the people. Right? Moses went and killed the Egyptian. Did God tell him? No. Whose mistake is that? His mistake. Right? Then you look at Joseph. God said, One day your brothers will bow down before you. Right? You will be the leader. Did I ask you to go and show the coat to anyone? They ask you to go and uh, explain all your visions to everyone. so sometimes we make mistakes I and mean, we blame it on god right of course we all make mistakes right but we don't blame it on god make mistakes overcome those mistakes god is bigger god is too wise to make mistakes god does not make mistakes we make the mistake and sometimes we blame god right anywhere in the old testament did god make a mistake anywhere in the new testament did god make a mistake there is no mistake god doesn't make mistakes he is perfect you know the song we sing no oh, you are a good father good good father he is perfect in all of his ways 
is perfect. If there are mistakes, it's only from our end. Or maybe we have not put faith in him. We have not trusted him completely. It says here, he's too good to do you wrong. He's too wise to make mistakes. And he's too strong to let you down. He will not let you down. When we feel weak, when we feel like giving up, he's too strong. All we need to do is look to him. He'll give us the strength, right? He's an unchanging heavenly father, an unfailing heavenly father, a bountiful and generous father, a merciful father. Im imagine we have all of this in our heavenly father. We can go to him, a redeeming father, an accepting father, a father of abundant grace, an empowering father and an infinite father. We have all of this. All of this is our father. So imagine if we have to go to him. He's not looking at how long you, you and I are praying and how long we are. He's not going to look at it that way. You know, for many years, I was in that mindset. Only if I pray, you know, God, God will love me more. God will anoint me more. You know, we are already anointed. When I pray, I'm not doing God a favor. I'm not saying, God, see, now I prayed one night, you should anoint me. No. God has already anointed us. When we pray, it is good for us, not good for God. You understand? It's not like we're doing, God. okay, God, see, you told me pray, I prayed. Then God can say, for whose good you prayed? I don't, I don't, I don't need anything. You prayed for your good. Yes or no? I prayed for my good. I did I, you know, sing songs, praise and worship Him for my good. Not for God's. No, God has thousands and millions of angels praying and singing for Him the whole time. He doesn't need us. Right? But when we worship Him, when we praise Him, He's delighted in that. Yes? He delights in the praises of His people. When we pray, he says, you seek and you will find me. You knock, the door will open because I delight in what you're doing. Yet it's for our good. Are you getting what I'm saying? Right? So never feel, oh man, I got up 5 a.m. I have to pray. Oh God, I'm very tired. What to do? If that's the attitude, change. You better go back to sleep. I may sound a little harsh, but it's the truth. Right? Because we're coming to God's presence. It is a loving Father. And He's all of this. He's accepting. He's loving. He's infinite. And so when we come to Him, it's not a favor that we are doing. But He loves us. He is accepting us. So it should be a joyful thing to go into His presence. Yes or no? Yes? Okay. We are family, chapter 87. Right? We belong to the family of faith. We are his sons and daughters. We love and relate to one another in spite of our differences. Now, if you look at it in the natural, how many of you have brothers and sisters? Most of us, right? You don't have any brother and sister? No brother, no sister. What's he say? Sorry? One brother. Okay. All right. So, brothers and sisters in a home. How many of you have fought with your brothers and sisters? Some of you haven't fought at all huh, with your brothers and sisters. Now, I see, I have two brothers. They have fought, and I've watched them fight. Because I was the youngest, so they never hit me. And I'll watch them, they'll be fighting. But one thing, you know what? We, as brothers, we, three of us right now, we are all in different countries, but we are very close to each other. Very close to each other, even now. Very close to each other. Right? Even though we are grown up now. Why? Because we have learned to be there for each other no matter what. No matter what. We're always there with each other. And sometimes my parents say, what only you'll talk like small children? 
because we do these WhatsApp call, video calls, and all. We speak for one and a half hours, two hours. What is my parents? What do you all talk so much? Said, Brothers, we have so many things to talk about. Right? Because there's a love that is so strong that we can relate to each other. Right? Yes or no? If you're having a family get together, you talk with your family, you can go on talking and talking and talking, and then you don't need lunchtime also, you will not feel hungry, no problem. You can talk and talk and talk, it can become evening, and then you want some tea, then even if there's no dinner, no problem, you can continue talking. Why? Because you love one another, you relate to one another. You know these family get-togethers? You keep talking. One point, one story will pick up, the others will take the same story. Why? Because you can relate to one another. That's what it is. When you go to the Father, if you love the Father, you have so much to talk about. Yes or no? If there's no relationship, you, we can't talk. Okay, Jesus, thank you for the fridge and thank you for washing machines. Thank you for giving me good health and thank you for Bible. What will happen? Jesus say, okay, welcome. But if you have a relationship with the Father, you come to Him and you can just talk to Him. It can go one hour, it can go two hours, it can go three hours. Why? It's a relationship. You just built it. Right? You can just talk and talk and talk to Him. The problem is in Christianity, what we have done, no, we have forgotten that He's our Father and we, we you know, we always think of, yes, there is a place and a time we have to, you know, close the door, pray and just be there. But remember that we can talk to Him at any time, any time. Just keep talking to Him. You know, there are times I just talk to Him. Say, God, you know, this week, new week, new month, God, please help me. This is what I need. This is the things to get done in church. These are the work that I have to complete. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I'm just talking. I know, God, you're with me. There are mistakes that I make, but I know that you will help me. Help me to learn from those mistakes. If there are times when I've got upset, forgive me. You know, there are times I've said some things which have hurt people, forgive me. Help me to be more wise. Help me to talk the right way. That's all, that's all I do, right? Now, I know that I'm not perfect, but these are things that help. Right? I just keep talking. Right? God, uh, you know, uh, th this. I have to lead worship. So help me. Give me the wisdom. Let your presence touch people's lives. Just, just talking to him. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen? Right? So make it a habit. Right? Make it a habit. What you have inside will come out. My teacher used to say, G-I-G-O. The subject is called Gigo. Everyone say Gigo. G-I-G-O. Oh. Garbage in, garbage out. Correct. If garbage goes in, garbage will come out. If God's word goes in, what will come out? God's word will come out. Yes? So keep, keep doing that. Understand that you are part of God's family. And you can just talk to him. Right? Then, chapter 88. Everyone with me? Okay, as... Let's read Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Again, we're talking about the witness, right? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and we are heirs. How many of you know what the meaning of heirs is? 
I've explained this once. Right? Heirs means there's one rich person. Right? And he has one son. Right? So he's an heir to the fortune. That means after this father dies, everything will go to the son. The son may be tenth fail. Doesn't matter. Right? So this businessman would have studied all his life, struggled and started the business. You know, put all his money in, put all his time, effort, went through loss, went through difficult times. And after 30 years of business, now his business is successful. Who went through all the problems? The father. Now the son has gone to school. He's been a naughty boy in the school. Not studying, not doing anything. He has done his 10th standard. He has failed 10th standard. Right? And... Now, suddenly the father dies. What happens? He's the heir to the business. He may be 10th fail, but whatever belongs to the father belongs to him now. That is called heir. Right? Understood, everyone? Now, what are we here? We are heirs to an inheritance. As an heir of God, you have inheritance. That means we shall be partakers of the inheritance God gives his people. We are in Christ and thus we partake in his glory. Everything that God has given to his son, he's giving to each one of us. Because we are heirs. Next verse says, uh, you know, we are joint heirs, meaning we are sharing with Christ. Uh, a, a joint heir or co-heirs it means we are part of that inheritance, right? So whatever Jesus is as a son, you and I are also have the same inheritance. We walk as Christ walk. We all we walk in all that Christ walked as a son of God, and wherever he, whatever he did, Jesus walked in victory over sin. You and I can walk in victory. Jesus walked in mastery over Satan and his demons. You and I can walk in mastery. Our life on earth here is the same as how Jesus was. How Jesus walked in authority, you and I can walk in that same authority. Why? Because we are co heirs with Christ. Imagine Jesus said to those demons, no? What did he say? Get out. All that we have to say is, demon, get out in Jesus' name. Has to go. Why? Because we are the same. We are like co heirs, Jesus and us. Just as Jesus walked, we are walking. Now, we may not be there in that level spiritually, or we may not be there in that anointing yet, or in that level of spirituality, but God is calling us to that. Yes? Right? God is calling us to that level. And it's possible. It is possible. Now, when you look at what's happening around the world, there are some great miracles that are happening. You know, uh, 20 years or 10 years, 15 years down the line, uh, previously, you know, a dead man coming back to life was a great thing. But now it's happening in churches. It's, it's happening. People are being raised from the dead. People who have leprosy are being healed. People who have cancers are being healed. Jesus did all of that. People who have who are possessed by demons for years are being, you know, uh, delivered. How? Because of the name of Jesus. Why is it when demons see you and me, they're fearful? Why is it? We are not looking so scary. Why do demons? Why are demons afraid when they look at us? Hmm. Very good. Correct. Because they see Jesus Christ in us. It's like Jesus is walking. Now, can the demon say you know, uh, anything against Jesus? So it's like Jesus is walking. Now you may think, hey, but I've seen in front of, I've stood in front of many demon possessed people. They have not got scared. They have not got scared and they have not been uh, delivered. 
So it doesn't mean that you're not uh, walking as Jesus is walking. It's just that we need to grow. We need to build ourselves. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to walk in that, that measure of faith. We need the anointing. So it involves us. You know, when Jesus was in his earthly ministry, did Jesus say, I'm the son of God, I don't need to pray? Did he need to pray? Yes or no? Do you think he needed to pray? Yes? If What if he didn't pray? What would have happened? You should think about all this, no? If he didn't pray, he was only the son of God. He came in. He knew, okay, one day I'll be crucified. But if he didn't pray, what would have happened? Would the demons possess people be healed? Will the people who are uh, sick, lepers and all be healed? No. Would they be healed or no? He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. So if, if Jesus didn't pray, would he have walked on water? Would he have healed the blind if he didn't pray? Yeah. Why did he pray? He prayed because he two things. One, he was depending on his heavenly father. Even though he could have done all of that, he was depending on the heavenly father. Saying, Father, I depend on you. I want to be obedient to you. Two, second reason he prayed was to set the example for you and me. If we didn't pray, if Jesus didn't pray, we wouldn't have prayed. Hey, Jesus went about healing everyone. We also would have tried it. Right? But Jesus prayed before that. Right? So, so it's very important to understand that when Jesus did something on earth, it was a reason, there's a reason he did it. And you and I can follow that. Be just like Jesus. Okay? Chapter 90 talks about ambassadors. We represent his kingdom. So wherever we go, we are ambassadors. We represent his kingdom. You know, every nation has an one ambassador. So there's a, you know, uh, globally, there's United Nations, right? There's this whole uh, gathering where one leader from each country comes and they represent the nation. So one person is sent from India to go to this country and represent India. Now this person can, if he doesn't know how to speak English, for example, what will they think? Oh, all the Indians don't know how to speak English. If this person doesn't have good manners or good etiquette, right? While eating food, he's dropping everywhere. What do they think? Oh, all the Indians are doing the same thing. Of this Indian is, you know, during the meeting, he's falling asleep. What do they think? Oh, all Indians are like this. Why? Because he's the ambassador. But if he goes in with, you know, well dressed, speaks fluently, appropriately, very well-mannered. What do they say? Oh, he's coming from India. So the Indians have, you know, grown. They're so well-mannered. They're so culturally, uh, you know, sensitive and wonderful. One person representing the entire 1.3 billion people in India. Now, you are ambassadors of Christ. So when people look at you, you're representing who? You're not representing your hometown. You're representing God's kingdom. You're representing Jesus. So that's what ambassadors is. Then chapter 91, awaiting future glory, revealing of the sons of God. Romans 8, 18 through 21. We'll read that. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So basically here, Paul is talking about 
the future glory that you and I will have, right? This present time as believers and as people who are walking on this earth, we will go through troubles. We will go through persecutions, challenges. But Paul is saying here, all these challenges, everything that I see is nothing compared to the glory that I will see in heaven with my heavenly father. So this trouble, challenges that I see is very small. One day I will be with God and I will see him in all his glory. And I will see him face to face. I will be transformed. And, and this trouble, what I'm facing, Paul is saying, this trouble, this, you know, they're hitting me, they're putting me into prison. It's very small because the future is bright. In the future, God has a big plan for me. In heaven, God has big things for me. So Paul is encouraging himself. Let's read 1 John 3, 1 to 3, and we'll close. Now, this is a wonderful verse, very, very powerful verse. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed unto us, that we are called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it does not know him. Don't be surprised if the world does not appreciate us and know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What a powerful verse. Future glory. But we know that when he is revealed, meaning when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like him and we will see him like he is. This is the greatest hope that you and I can have as believers. The greatest hope. No matter what happens in life, if I fail, if I go through difficulties, if I lose a loved one, if I lose my family members, very painful, very hurtful time. But the hope is one day we will see Jesus face to face. That is the greatest hope you can have as believers. All that we are doing, all that we are reading, all that we are praying and worshipping, one day we will see him in all his glory, in, in, in all his majesty. We will see him face to face. That is the joy. So even as we live life every day, we live with that assurance. Right? Now, just because we're going to see him one day doesn't mean we don't do anything here. No. We work, we do ministry, we do everything that we have to do. But the hope is one day I will see the Lord Jesus. That is our final destination. And so we should be encouraged. Amen? All right. So we'll stop here. And then we'll pick up from Friday in our next class, chapter 92 onwards. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, those who are online. God bless you.